the other uh, whole group of uh, trials that were presented in endocrine uh, included either ways of overcoming resistance or enhancing the effect of endocrine therapy. And we know that in patients who've gotten prior endocrine therapy, as you get each subsequent treatment, the likelihood of responding declines. Uh, we saw one very important trial that, again, was in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, this week as well by Bazelga and colleagues, and that was the Bolero trial in which patients who had previously been treated uh, with a nonsteroidal aromatase inhibitor either received exemestane or exemestane plus an mTOR inhibitor, and the mTOR inhibitor was everolimus. mTOR is an important downstream uh, node in a pathway uh, that may represent uh, a reason why patients become resistant to endocrine therapy. So if you're able to inhibit mTOR, you may be able to enhance the response to endocrine therapy or um, you know, re-challenge the patients with endocrine therapy with a higher expectation of benefit. mTOR is a downstream target. In other words, in when you look at the pathways that are always shown on the screen when people talk about targeted agents and pathways that drive cancer growth, invasion, metastases, uh, and uh, resistance to therapy, mTOR is a downstream target. So after you've signaled through the receptor or through another mechanism and you activate the PI3 kinase AKT P10 pathway, mTOR is activated downstream and appears to play a very important role in resistance to therapy, not just to hormone therapy, but also to HER2-directed therapy, where it's also being evaluated and has encouraging early results. So in Bolero 2, we took data from previous studies in the neoadjuvant setting, actually, uh, and used this uh, as well as preclinical data to uh, further study the hypothesis that adding an mTOR inhibitor to hormone therapy in more resistant disease, so not right up front, uh, could improve outcome since the synergy was seen in preclinical studies. So in this trial, patients either got exemestane or exemestane plus everolimus, and what was demonstrated was a markedly improved time to disease progression if they got the combination. So uh, by the investigator analysis, it was doubled when an independent radiologic review looked at progression-free survival. It was something on the order of 11 months versus 5 months favoring the doublet of everolimus and exemestane. The trial randomized women in a two-to-one fashion to receive everolimus or placebo, and the steering committee, I have to say, was surprised at the magnitude of the data that had a p-value uh, times 10 to the minus 16th, showing a benefit in progression-free survival. We don't yet have overall survival data because these patients live longer than patients receiving chemotherapy, uh, but there are numerically more deaths in the exemestane arm than in the everolimus and exemestane arm. Having worked with the PI3 AKT mTOR pathway inhibitors for a number of years and having seen RAD001 or everolimus be approved in other malignancies, it was great to see the results of the Bolero 2 trial. The Bolero 2 trial showed a very outstanding result for the patients that received the combination in terms of progression-free survival. We don't have long-term survival yet from the trial, but we do see more responses. And most importantly, with the addition of a second drug, seeing, in fact, maintenance or improvement even in quality of life. Always debatable in terms of how to measure that, but I think we know with women with metastatic breast cancer's quality of life not successfully treated will continue to decline, and this result actually showed that we could maintain or improve it for some patients. In general, very well tolerated and all oral regimen. And we know that for many estrogen receptor positive patients, one of the goals of therapy is delaying the time to chemotherapy. And this interesting biologic combination seems to prove that point. Uh, with the use of everolimus, there was more in the way of side effects uh, in the sense that patients had rash, some diarrhea, some stomatitis. So that's an important thing that we need to look at carefully because obviously endocrine therapy is generally well tolerated. If you add something to it and you make it less tolerable, it becomes not as attractive. But that has to be balanced against the marked improvement in progression-free survival for these patients. And this whole strategy, again, may represent a new way of giving endocrine therapy, significantly improving what we might expect versus single agent alone. Now, the addition of targeted agents increases toxicity and uh, everolimus is no different. There is somehow off-target or maybe target toxicity that results in mouth sores or stomatitis. 
There's also a very small risk of interstitial pneumonitis where patients have a cough and shortness of breath as well as chest x-ray findings consistent with interstitial pneumonitis. We found that an awareness of these toxicities, holding the drug dose and restarting at a lower dose uh, really ameliorates this toxicity and also helps to manage the rare case of interstitial pneumonitis. But in addition to following toxicity, we also followed quality of life in that trial and found that although quality of life deteriorated over time as the cancer progressed, that it was absolutely equivalent between the combination and single agent arm. So very exciting data and I think really changes the whole scene for treating ER positive disease with the recognition that by doing a large randomized trial in the right setting with an agent that's very active and a good hypothesis, even without so molecularly selecting patients who are most likely to benefit, we can see a big difference in outcome. The future here is to look at tumors to look for mutations like PI3 kinase mutations, use an agent that's specifically targeted to PI3 kinase mutations in combination with hormone therapy. There's already very encouraging data that some of these agents have single agent activity in hormone receptor positive but hormone resistant disease when selected through these molecular tests. So I think that we have a new treatment for metastatic ER positive breast cancer that is likely to be practice changing. Uh, we're waiting for survival data, but I don't think that changes is the impact of the data at all. And it breathes new energy and fuel into the study of these targeted agents and reversing hormone resistance. Ideally, we want to identify those patients in the early stage setting and prevent recurrent disease. So I think the bottom line message from all of these trials, many of which are smaller, but the Bolero is clearly a pivotal trial, is that we may have new strategies for improving the effect of endocrine therapy. I think very much that uh, the Bolero trial represents an important finding. I think the results of that trial are likely to go to the FDA for approval. You know, and one never can predict with certainty whether the FDA will approve it, but I think an mTOR inhibitor for this purpose is likely to be approved soon. And whether it's based on the Bolero trial or additional data that comes from other trials, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think soon we'll be seeing the use of these agents with endocrine therapy in community practice.